every good gift, God, is from you. Every good gift, God, is from you. Lord, tonight I pray that people can come to know you. That people can come to know who you are, God. That you are a good God. That you are a loving God. That you're a providing God. That you're a caring God. That you're a healing God. That you're a saving God. Come on. We want to get to know you more. More. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him.
voice to Jesus. Come on, shout to Jesus tonight. Come on, shout to Jesus. Come on, church. Lift your voice to Jesus tonight. What's up, Life Point Church? Are you glad you came tonight so far? So I was praying in January during our fast, and I said, Lord, we want encounters with you. We want to have moments with God, and I want those to happen in your life every day. I don't want you to depend on this building or this team. I want you to depend on the Holy Spirit in your life. But when we come together for a big Wednesday, let's lean in a little bit. So I think about when the, when the people sang these, this lyric to the Lord at Palm Sunday as he's coming into Jerusalem on a donkey and they had just anticipated for centuries the coming of this Messiah, singing Hosanna in the highest. I just, I love that lyric. Man, I just love this song. And then we started this with Psalm 23. I just go, Lord, I don't know that we really believe how good you are for us. So I just wanna walk you back through. Thank you, Pastor Jonathan, for Psalm 23, man. What a word. So Psalm 23 says, the Lord is my shepherd. Now these Hosanna singers knew this about Jesus. They were waiting on this shepherd to come and fulfill this prophetic word from Psalm 23. He takes care of my wants. He makes me lie down. He don't say, hey, you should go lie down. If you get close to Jesus, he gonna make you lie down but he's gonna make you lie down where it's green and it's good and it's for you. And some of us fight, hey, wait, you keep clapping, you're stealing my time, stop it. He makes you lie down, which means everything he has for you is good. Cause the green pastures are good. How many of you know he doesn't make you lie down in like burly pastures and dry ground? He makes you lie down where it's good and he leads me to still waters. He restores me, he leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake, God wants you righteous for him, not you, for him. So watch this, even though I walk through it, anybody ever go through it? Valley of the shadow of death, I won't fear, because God, you're with me. He says, your rod and your staff, they come for me. You're pulling me, you're pushing me, your discipline, your correction, you, you, you move along, kid, and, and you get up here close to me. That rod and staff, they're good for you. And this is my favorite part. Prepare, not yet. Uh, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. My, you anoint my head with oil. And then, and then here's the part that I want you to hear tonight because we're gonna move into the things. We're just gonna have a moment with God. <clears throat> Verse six, surely, not surely like Aunt Shirley, surely, sure, like for sure, for real, for real. Truly, Jesus would say, truly, truly, which means what? For real, true. Like Jesus is truth and he goes, truly, truly, that means for real, true. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me every day for the rest of my life. Now wait, stop clapping, listen, listen. In the English, it doesn't really do it justice. In the Hebrew, it says that the chesed of God, the goodness and mercy, which is the faithfulness of God to be faithful. It's like a double punch of faithfulness. The goodness of God to be good. It's the, the righteousness of God to be righteous to you, the faithfulness of God to be faithful to you. Some of us have forgotten that God never has a good, a bad moment in your life. He's always good and he's good to be good. He's faithful to be faithful. And look, the word says, the faithfulness of God to be faithful will run after me all the days of my life. Well, that's like being a little kid chasing your older brother. That's what I did my whole life. I chased my brothers and I didn't really catch them because I was chubby. But the original word in the Hebrew says, the faithfulness of God to be faithful will violently pursue you intending to overtake you. That's actually what the word Radaf means. He's gonna chase you down and his intention is not just to run behind you, but to catch you and to overcome you with the faithfulness to be faithful. And some of us have forgotten that God is not only good, he's good at being good. He's truly, truly, he's faithful to be faithful. And I don't know what valley you're walking through tonight. 
But I'm telling you, the goodness of our good God is faithful to be faithful. He's truly true. He's surely, surely, surely for you tonight. And you just need to press into the goodness of God and lay down the garbage that you're carrying with you and just say, Lord, Hosanna in the highest. You're so good to me. You're so faithful to me. And he is violently pursuing you, intending to overtake you today. Some of us are waiting to heaven to live like we're his sons and daughters. Can I tell you that today he anoints your head? Today he's prepared a table for you in the presence of your enemies. Today he's good to you and he's faithful to you and he's faithful to be faithful. So could you everyone around this room, let's have a moment with God. Come on, everybody, lift your hands to the Lord. You say, I'm uncomfortable with this. Well, get comfortable with it because the goodness of God is in this place. We're gonna sing Hosanna one more time. And I wanna ask you, whatever you're dealing with, whatever you've stopped trusting God over, whatever, you've, whatever valley you're going through, and you actually believe this is the place you're gonna die, and this is the place you're gonna lose it all, go back to the faithfulness of God to be faithful to you and let Him catch you. Let Him overtake you. Let Him have you tonight in Jesus' name. Come on, sing Hosanna and let's go all in. Come on, let Him have all of you. goodness overtake us God heal us bring peace and provision comfort us in our storm Lord God I pray for everyone who's come with a need God that they would meet with you tonight you're a way maker God you're a miracle doer and performer you're still meeting us in our moments of brokenness and woundedness and God we repent for believing the lie of the devil that this would be the valley we'd lie down in God, even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we'll never fear because the goodness of our God is overtaking us and overcoming us. You're violently in hot pursuit. We are sons, not slaves. We are daughters. We are not defeated. We are bought with the blood of Jesus. And we receive everything you have for us in the mighty name of Jesus. Be healed. Be delivered. Come on, be redeemed. Be set free. Let your marriages be healed tonight. Grab this person you're conflicting with and just be healed in Jesus' name. Thank you that your goodness, your mercy pursues us. You can have your way in this room. Holy Spirit, we covet your movement. We covet your presence. Fill us right now. Everybody pray this for me. Say, God, I'm all in. Come on, pray like you mean it. God, I'm all in. Say, Holy Spirit, fill me tonight. Say, God, have your way in me tonight set me free forgive me i receive your mercy your goodness you're truly truly in jesus name come on can we give the lord a shout of praise tonight come on you glad you came to church thank you lord thank you lord well praise the lord you glad you came to church tonight Hey, do me a favor and turn around to five people just right in your circle. Give a fist bump. Say, you needed that, and so did I. Come on, turn around. Say hi.
Come on, ladies, who's coming to Flourish Conference this year? So excited. We got a great lineup for you that night. Uh, hey, welcome to our big Wednesday night service. Hopefully you brought your Bible, something to take notes with. Uh, my name is Mike Burnett. I get to serve here as lead pastor. Please forgive my voice. I've got a sinus thing going on. It's the coronavirus. <laughs> That's not funny. I shouldn't have made a joke about that. Lord, bring healing. But uh, she's binding me in the name of Jesus down here on the front row. Uh, anyway, this is all sign of stuff. But anyway, um, hey, so glad that you're here. We want to get right into the word. Uh, in January, we put out our newest LifePoint bracelet uh, during the fast, 21 days of fasting. And it was during that time that I really sensed the Lord give me a, just a word to pray over you and to pray over services this year that we just have encounters with God. And so as we do every year on this bracelet, we have three words repeated, uh, pray, listen, move. And I think that's the right order Jesus said, anyone who comes to me, hears my words and does what I say will be like a person who builds his house on a rock. And then when storms hit, when life happens, they'll survive. How many of you know storms hit everyone? Life happens to everyone. Jesus gave us that formula. He said, whoever comes to me, hears what I say and then does it. And he said, the person who comes to me, hears what I say and doesn't do what I say, is a person who builds their house on a rock. When the storms come, their life falls apart. So I think this is the pattern. We come to the Lord in prayer. And prayer is more than just dropping off your to-do list to Jesus, right? It's about aligning your life to him. And then we listen to the word of God. We listen to the spirit of God. And then before we make decisions, before we act on things, we let God speak to us. And then we move accordingly. So that's kind of the, the, the genesis behind this bracelet, what it's about. We pray first. We come to the Lord first. We listen to God, and then we move accordingly. Well, I think tonight is one of those nights. We've come to the house of God to hear from a man of God and, and to hear a word from the Lord. And my challenge is as we come to the Lord, you've done that in worship, and now we're doing that in expectation that we'd hear what God is saying to our church tonight, and that we would leave here not going, well, that was good, I learned something, but we leave here going, okay, God, now what? Have your way. What do you want from me? Can I hear a big amen, everybody? So our, our, our attitude tonight is, Lord, we've come. We want to hear from you. And we want to leave here and live accordingly in Jesus' name. Hey, your generosity always makes a difference in our church and through our church. And so uh, today we had the privilege as a staff <clears throat> to spend some great time with a great friend of mine who pastors uh, in Plano, Texas, a great church, growing church. And uh, he's, he's been 42 years, 42 years ago he planted this church with his wife. And man, what about longevity? Isn't that amazing, everybody? And uh, <clears throat> He's been coaching our team and working with me. And then tomorrow, your generosity has made a way for this as well. Uh, we're going to be hosting about 80 or so pastors tomorrow for a roundtable. And you guys have helped make that happen. So thank you for your generosity. If any of those pastors are here tonight, could you just wave your hands? I know some of you guys are here in the service. A bunch of guys here. And then, again, about 80 of them are coming tomorrow. So thank you guys so much for being here. And uh, I just want, I, I want to just tell you, honestly, I'm so honored to have Pastor Gerald Brooks with us tonight. He's a phenomenal pastor, a gifted communicator, a great leader. He's, he's taken to my family, which means he's taken to you. So he prays for me, which means he prays for you. And you've never met him before, but you've heard of him and from him through what he's done in my life and in our ministry here. Would you do me a favor, life point, and get up and give it up for Pastor Gerald Brooks. Come on, everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Um, you don't know me, but I want to take a moment and do something that I'm privileged to do. Uh, as Pastor Mike mentioned, I've been in ministry uh, for 42 years. I know that you're looking at me right now and said, he looks so incredibly young. There's no way that can be true. So I want you to get that out of your system. Just turn to the person next to you and say, he looks young. I know you want to say that. I mean, the 42 years is just defining you. But, but I have had the privilege of being in ministry for 42 years. So the first thing I need to do is I need to be a, a minister to ministers. So what I want to do is, Mike, I want to say thank you. Thank you so much for your faithfulness. Thank you so much for following God. Thank you so much for going to Clarksville, Tennessee. Thank you for not only going, but staying in Clarksville, Tennessee. Thank you for building something great for God that isn't a statement about you, but a statement about Him. But then I want to say something else that's very, very important. 
See, I've done what I've done through the power of God, but also because I have a godly wife of God. And Stephanie, I want to say something to you. You're the only one in this room that lives in the splash zone. Every time there's disappointment and he deals with it, you get to experience it. Every time there's hurt and heartache, you get to know it. Every time someone leaves the church and as much as we put a good face on it and you've poured your heart into it, he comes home and you ache with it. You've been the aftermath of every funeral, every tragedy, every difficult time. And what I know is, is that none of us who are men of God last in ministry without great women of God. And and what I want to say to you is, nobody in this room may understand what a few of us understand. But you're a rock star for doing what you do. Because you help hold him together so that he can hold others together. And so I wanna say thank you to you. Thank you for being there. Thank you for staying there. Thank you that when this wasn't here, you were there. And when it didn't look like this was gonna be there, you were here. Thank you for being there. And I just wanna say to you, as a representative of the kingdom of God, how immensely proud I am of you. Well, this evening I get to spend a few moments with you, and I need to describe a little bit so we can get on the same bandwidth. Uh, I am a pastor, and apparently uh, they've heard about me because they're sending out alerts about me right now. Uh, I thought if I came to Clarksville, Tennessee, they wouldn't be able to find me. But somehow, I'm on the radar screen of Clarksville, Tennessee. Now, for all of you that are old, that your alerts are going, just hand it to whoever's young next to you, and they will show you how to turn off the alerts, because if all you do is silence it, and the alert comes on it, it's still going to come on. So, all old people, just hand your phone to the right, and someone young will take it and turn off notifications. Now... If I go past an hour and a half, they've been told to set off the notifications again. But that's not going to happen. I do need to get you on the same page. I'm a pastor. It's all I've ever done. I pastored people. I'm with people on their best day, and I'm with people on their worst day. I'm with people when they are on top of the mountain, and I'm with people when they feel like the mountain's on top of them. It's all I've ever done in life. Now, as a pastor, I pastor with a teaching gift. And that's very important because if you're waiting for the anointing to fall, this is it. I want you to feel it right now. This is the anointing. So if you're waiting for the big moment, we're having it right now. So I want you to turn the person next to you and look at him and say, this is all he's got. So we've got to help him. So, I need you to get in on the front end because this is it. But today I want to pastor you, but I'm going to pastor you by teaching. Heavenly Father, it is such an honor to be in this house of God. It is such a privilege to be with Mike and Steph and to see their team and just the things that you are doing. I am so thrilled to hear the stories of greatness, not of great men and women, but a great God who is able to go into the hearts and lives of people and change their lives. But right now, God, I need your help. See, I don't know anyone in this room, but you know everyone in this room. And since you know everyone in this room, please help me. See, you know the best of the people, but you also know the worst of them. You know the things they dream, and you know the things that they dread. You know the things that they hope, and you know the things that they fear. You know the things that they tell everyone, and you know the things that they've told no one. And because of that, Lord, you can minister. You can go into the hearts and the souls of every man and woman in this place, and you can speak. 
And I pray, Father, today that you would do that. Because, Lord, we're on a journey. None of us come to this location this evening because we want to stay what we are. We want to be transformed. We want to be more like Jesus. We want to reflect you in ways like we've never reflected. And I pray, Father, that this evening you're going to help us. And when it's all said and done, you'll help us to be more like Jesus. Because that is our passionate prayer. And we all agree together saying, Amen. This evening I want to talk to you about God's promise for stormy weather. God's promise for stormy weather. You can't read the Bible without realizing that there are a whole lot of bad weather days in the Bible. You go to the Old Testament, you bump into a man named Noah. The thing about Noah is this whole story centers on some bad weather kind of days. Those kind of days that are just really, really bad. And so we know the story of Noah. You go a little bit further in the Old Testament and you bump into a man named Jacob and you find out that he's going to have a bad weather day. But you go even further and you're going to bump into a man named Jonah. His whole story is going to turn on a bad weather day. You go a little bit further and you come into the New Testament and you find 12 men that are Jesus' disciples. These 12 men that are Jesus' disciples, I don't know what it was, but if you ever put these guys in a boat together, it was going to be like being on a bad carnival cruise line moment. <laughs> Something was going to happen that you didn't want to happen. It's going to go on. But if you go even a little further, you run into the Apostle Paul, and you run into Acts chapter 27 and verse 20, and it says this, and the terrible storm raged. Now, you got to understand, if you do what I do for a living, you understand that any time the Bible gives you a qualifier, it's trying to draw you into the moment so that you will feel it and you will get it. So it says the terrible storm. It could have said just the storm rage, but it doesn't do that. It says the terrible storm. It wants you to understand that this is a storm that's intense. It goes on and it says the terrible storm raged for many days. So this isn't the storm that came in the morning, gone in the evening. It's just going to be there a short period of time. This storm came, and it didn't go away. So it says the terrible storm raged for many days. And then it says this, neither could we see the sun above nor the stars. They've lost perspective. They can't tell if time is coming. They can't tell what day it is, whether it's a day, whether it's a week. They've lost all perspective. So the terrible storm raged. It raged for many days. They could neither see the sun or the stars above. And it says these words, till all hope was gone. See, I'm a pastor. I know what that looks like. I know what it's like to stand up before my congregation and look at the person who walked into the doctor's office this week and the report came back and the report didn't come back positive the way they wanted it to. And they walk into a place like this, and all hope is gone. It's not that they don't believe in God above, but they've lost all hope that they will ever be well again. That they will ever feel good again. Will it always be this way? Will this be my ending? See, I know what it's like to pastor that young couple that stood on a platform like this and they exchanged their vows thinking that they were going to have the dream, but somehow the dream turned into a nightmare and they are fighting every day and they've lost all hope. They've lost all hope that their marriage will ever be a good one. I know what it's like to pastor the family that their kids keep making bad decisions. It's not what they were raised to make, but the kids keep making bad decisions, and now they've lost all hope that the kids will ever turn out well. Here's the thing. The Bible knows that storms can cause you to lose hope. See, the biggest tragedy in the church today is people who have hope in life, but they have lost sight of that for their life. They don't have any hope for them. I got to build a bridge. I fly a whole lot. In fact, I have 4.3 million miles sitting on American Airlines planes. 
What that means in practical sense is TSA has searched me in every possible part of my body. There is no part of me that hasn't been searched at some point. Now, the thing about that is, is when you fly a whole lot, sometimes you have some moments. I was flying back from the West Coast. I had been speaking. As I was flying back from the West Coast, this is many years ago. Some of you won't even believe that it existed, but I can remember getting out of my aisle seat. I can remember reaching up to the overhead. As I reached up to the overhead, what happened was I had uh, my suitcase up there, and I'm pulling out a book. Some of you don't know what a book is because you're real, real young, but those are hard covers on the front and the back, and they have paper in the middle. And so I'm reaching, and I'm grabbing this book, and as soon as I grabbed this book, the brightest light I've ever seen happens. A light that's so bright that if you were trying to look at your hand, you couldn't tell that your hand was there. It totally blinded. So I'm on this plane, all of a sudden you see this bright light. Simultaneously with it, I hear the loudest noise I've ever heard. It's so loud. In my head, here's what I thought. This is what it's like to be on a plane when it blows up. Literally, my head's thinking that. I'm on a plane, it's blowing up, I'm seeing the flash, I'm hearing the noise. This is what it's like. We're about to fall to the ground from 35,000. That's what my head's telling me. Except the light goes to normal and the sound, the echo begins to fade away. As it begins to fade away, everyone in the plane It's just stunned. Nobody's saying anything. It's just total silence. It was there that I learned one of the first rules of flight, and that is that pilots are always taught, fly the plane first, talk second. Because the pilot doesn't come on. No one knows what's happened. And so in the middle of this, about four minutes later, the pilot comes on and he says, guys, I just want to let you know we've had one of those unfortunate experiences that happens in flight, uh, and that is that our plane has been struck by lightning. And being struck by lightning, we've gone through all of our protocols, everything is fine, we are proceeding to Dallas, but I know that this is disconcerting. This was the first of two times I've ever heard a pilot say this, and the pilot came on. I know that this was worrisome to some of you, but I've told the flight attendants, it's open bar, drinks are on us. (laughs) Now, I don't drink, so it just meant unlimited peanuts. But the pastor who was traveling with me, that was the night he started drinking. (laughs) He's now gone through rehab twice, we think. This one's going to help. But can I tell you about that? Nobody gets up in the morning and prays to be in a storm. See, no one got up and said, God, put me on a plane so at 35,000 feet, I get hit by lightning, and in the middle of it, I feel like my life is going to explode, that I'm going to fall to the ground. Nobody prays that. But nobody gets up in the morning and says, God, send me a bad weather day. Send me the kind of weather that is so intense that it makes me question whether I can see God above and I lose all hope in my life. Nobody prays that. You know what we pray? God. Let this be a great day. God, let this be a day filled with your peace and filled with your joy. Let it be a perfect day. But I pastored long enough to know that there are people in this audience right now, you're in the middle of a storm. I pastored long enough to recognize that there are people that if they're not careful, they've lost all hope and all hope is gone for them. They've lost hope for their health, hope for their family, hope for their kids. They've lost hope. No one prays to be in a storm, but the Bible makes it clear there are bad weather days. So what I don't want to give you is I want to give you four things you need to know about bad weather days. Four things that when the weather gets bad, you need to know. The first one is this. When you find that you're in the middle of a storm, it doesn't mean that you've done anything wrong. It doesn't mean that you've done anything wrong. Just because you're in a storm doesn't mean that you've done anything wrong. Can I tell you that night that our plane was hit by lightning, nobody stood up and said, the pilot sinned. (laughs) You know why they didn't say that? Because they weren't in church. 
But people who've been in church, as soon as something goes wrong, you know what we say? I must have done something to cause this. So Wednesday night service, we still do Wednesday nights. We don't do them all big. We have some real small ones also. But on our Wednesday night services, we're doing our Wednesday night service. We're finally finished. And I'm standing at the back of our churches. I'm standing at the back of the church. There's a guy over here to my left, and he's watching me. He's bird-dogging me. What this means in pastor speak is that he's not just wanting to walk through and shake my hand. What this guy's wanting to do is he's wanting to have a conversation. Now, he's waiting for everyone to clear out, but as everyone begins to clear out, he starts walking three steps away from me. I look, and I see tears running down his face, and I'm thinking, what in the world's going on that this guy would be crying, and tears are running? And this isn't just, you know, uh, a, a little guy. This is a man's man, and I'm looking in tears. He gets another step away, and he says, Pastor, just tell me. If you'll just tell me. If you'll just tell me. I'm looking at him. I have no clue what's going on, but I'm watching this guy as he walks, tears running. He said, Pastor, just tell me. Just tell me. And I said, tell you what, if you'll just tell me what I did wrong, I'll repent. And I look at him. I said, hey, you've got to give me some information. I don't know what's going on here. And he began to describe his life, and it was some events that no one would want to go through. But in the midst of those events, here's what was going on. In his mind, the only way that it could be happening is that he had to have done something wrong. Now, what this guy had done was he had done like a lot of Christians. He had torn his soul apart. I looked at him. I said, first of all, have you asked God if you did anything wrong? He says, oh, I've asked. I said, did God tell you anything? He said, I haven't heard a thing. I said, second of all, have you asked God if he'll show you something? He said, I have. He said, he hasn't showed me anything. I said, well, then if you confessed anything you think you've done, he said, yes. I look at him and I said, in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9, it says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful. Aren't you glad that we serve a faithful God? It says that he's faithful and just to forgive us. But see, in his mind, here's what he thought. What if I did something wrong and I didn't know it was wrong? then I can't repent. And I looked at him and I said, well, the verse covers that. It says, if you confess your sins, what you know to be wrong, he not only forgives us of our sin, but he cleanses us of all unrighteousness, which are the things that you did wrong that you don't know are wrong. And so I look at this guy and he's ripped his soul apart. He's torn himself all because he thinks the only reason he could be in a storm is because he did something wrong. But in John chapter 16 and verse 33, it says this, in this world. How many of you realize you're in this world? Some of you don't have a clue where you're at, do you? (laughs) It says, in this world, you'll have tribulation. Let me translate that. In this world, you'll have trouble. In this world, you'll have problems. In this world, you'll have difficulties. In this world, you'll have challenges. But be of good cheer because I've overcome the world. Now, some of you, you're having trouble in your life, and the easiest thing for you to do is to think that you caused it. And because you think you caused it, you can't appropriate faith in God because you think, I did something wrong. I've got to clear everything up. And here's the simple truth. If you did something wrong, you know it. But if you didn't, walk with God because you just happen to be in this world. See, when my plane was hit by lightning, it wasn't because anyone sinned. It was because we live in a world where there's lightning. And I was on a plane at the wrong time and the wrong place. But in church circles, if you have something wrong in your life, you did something wrong. But Jesus didn't teach that. Second thing about storms that you need to understand is that You don't always get warned when there's a storm. See, I don't know much about Tennessee. I know a lot about Texas. But where we're at, we're at the end of what they call Tornado Alley. And Tornado Alley is an interesting deal where you have uh, cool, moist air coming up from the gulfs, hitting uh, warm air coming from the west. And where they hit, you have rising air, falling air. And if it hits right, you'll create circulation. So in our area, we have a siren system. When that siren system goes off, it is to let you know that bad weather's coming, that bad weather is going to be there. And I'm telling you, you may be hearing impaired, but nobody's that hearing impaired. 
When this siren goes off, everybody knows it. Except one evening, a storm came through and it did damage in our community. But no siren went off. People in Plano were ticked. How in the world could we have a siren system? No one was warned. So they began to research and they said, well, the siren system's designed if it's coming this way, we can tell you, or if it's on this side, but the storm formed right over, we could warn you. I need to build a bridge. Let me put it to you this way. Again, I was flying back to Dallas. I was flying back to Dallas, and usually if you fly from west to east, they fly at a higher altitude. So we had been about 35,000 feet. When you get to be around Amarillo, they begin to do a descent, and so we're going down to about 25,000 feet. When they get just on the other side towards Wichita Falls, you'll get to about 20,000 feet. So we're at 20,000 feet. If you could look at the radar, Here's what you would see. You would see storms down in Waco, south of Dallas. You would see storms up in Oklahoma City, north of Dallas. But whenever you see storms there and storms there, there may not be storms in Dallas, but you know a line is forming. The problem is you don't know when that line's going to form in. You don't know if it's going to form in immediately, if it's going to take time. You don't know. So the pilot's just making his regular descent. We get to about 15,000 feet, and here's our plane. This is Mother Earth. This is how you want it to fly like this. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, the plane just falls. It goes just literally like this. It's like someone put their hand on top of uh, my hand and just pushed it down. We didn't nosedive. It just fell. I literally watched the guy next to me. He was a drinker. His drink went all the way up to the ceiling. It came down, landed on his head. That night, he was baptized. Not in the name of Jesus, (laughs) but he was baptized. I watched his laptop go all the way up. It came all the way down. This guy is just smacked on the top of his head by the personal computer. First time I ever saw it get that personal with somebody, but it landed right on top of his head. You're sitting there and you're just feeling this falling. You're wanting everything in the world to hold on to. You're holding on to your seat, but your seat's falling. You're just sort of braced. And then all of a sudden, as we begin to fall, you feel the integrity around the plane begin to stabilize. You feel the pilot begin to regain control. Again, everybody's totally startled. Nobody's saying anything, but again, the rule of piloting is fly the plane first, talk to the people in the plane second. So after about five minutes, the pilot comes on and he says, guys, I I just need to tell you something. We experienced extreme turbulence. I need you to remember that phrase. He says, we need to let you know we experienced that. We checked all of our systems. Everything's good. But in the midst of that, we'll be landing in Dallas. Everyone's just totally shaken up. Now, the reason I had taken that flight is because Cody, my son, it was an overnight flight, was going to play a baseball game, and I wanted to watch him play the next day. So finally, we're home. I get up the next day. I'm at the ball game. Now, you're the baseball field. I'm seated here behind home plate. You're literally the pitcher's mound center field. The guy next to me, Roger, he was the number seven pilot ever hired by Southwest Airlines. So when they only had six pilots, he was the seventh one. He had flown hundreds and thousands of hours. So we're sitting here, we're side by side, we're not looking at each other, we're just being cordial, we're watching the game. His son's on Cody's team, we're watching it. And Roger knew that I was flying in, and he says, hey, Gerald, how was your flight last night? And I said, Roger, I said, the flight was a little bit rough. He said, well, Gerald, you understand turbulence. He started treating me like I'd never flown. All turbulence is is warm air that's bubbling up. And you're just feeling that air. I said, I said, Roger, I know what turbulence is. This one turbulence. And then I said this. I said, the pilot said that it was extreme turbulence. Now, Roger's looking this way, just in a normal voice. And then all of a sudden, he goes like this. He said, what did he say? And he yells at me. <laughs> he goes, what did he say? I said, he said extreme turbulence. And when he yells at me, I felt like I was married there for a second. And so I'm going, where did this come from? What did I miss? It's not our anniversary. What is it? And so I'm just sitting there, and he says, do you know what that means? I said, Roger, I do not know what it means, but I do know what it feels like. (laughs) He says, that means that when they land, they have to take that plane out of service. 
They cannot fly it again because every little weld spot, they have to check it. I said, well, Roger, when we landed, I had to check some spots. <laughs> and several of them were leaking. Now, here's the thing. If you go up previous in Acts to verse 13, it says, and the winds blew softly. And they supposing that they had their opportunity set sail. See, they thought everything was perfect. They thought there were no problems. They thought there were no challenges. But see, I pastor people, and here's what they'll say. My life was perfect until that day. My life was perfect until the test came back. My life was perfect until the police knocked at our door. My life was perfect until I was served papers. See, Many times we find ourselves in events and we're not giving warning and we just sit there and think, well, did I miss God? Did I didn't see this coming? That I didn't feel this coming? Because any of you that have played sports, you know the hit that hurts you the most is the one that you didn't see coming. But sometimes in life, when you're in a storm, number one, it doesn't mean you did anything wrong. Number two, Sometimes you're not given any warning. But number three, when you find yourself in a storm, storms are an x-ray of the soul. They tell us what's really happening in you. See, your pastor talked about it from Matthew. In Matthew 7, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus turns to his disciples and he says this. He says, there's a man who hears these sayings of mine. So this person goes to church. It says they hear these sayings of mine and they practice them. So he not only goes to church on Sunday, but he does something with it on Monday. And it says he hears these sayings of mine and he puts them into practice. And then the storm came. But because he heard and he practiced, even though the storm came, his house stood because his house was built on something bigger than him it was built on the rock. But then he says, but there is a man that hears these sayings of mine. He goes to church on Sunday. But when he goes to church on Sunday, he doesn't do anything with it on Monday. You know who that person is. You know that there are people just like you. You're good at church, but you're bad at God. And so you're sitting there and you're good. You can show up and you cross your arms and you got it together because you're good at church. You're just bad at God. And they hear the sayings on Sunday, but they don't put them into practice. And it says the storms come. And when the storms come, what happens is their house falls. Now, here's what I wish that verse said. That if you heard the word of God and did the word of God, the storm would never come. That's what I wished it said. It doesn't say that. It says the storm came to both houses. The only difference was one person heard and did what Jesus said, and his house stood. See, every week you get to determine which one of those verses you're living in. Whether you're going to be the person who hears the word of God and does the word of God or hears the word of God and ignores the word of God, whether you're coming to church just because your girlfriend's here or mama's here or someone else is here, you get to make a decision which person you are. I got to build a bridge to help you. I'm flying out of LaGuardia. If you've ever flown out of LaGuardia, it's the New York City area. You have three airports. You have LaGuardia here, 
and then you have Newark here, and then not only do you have Newark, but you have JFK here. So you have these three airports. If you could look down from the sky, what you'd see is you'd see two, three cylinders, planes landing here, taking off here, landing here, taking off here, landing here, taking off here, and so you would see those. But because there's three airports there, and then if you went down here, you have Ronald Reagan in uh, Washington, D.C., when you leave LaGuardia, they have to take off at a higher angle. So like Dallas, where you got a lot of land around you, they take off pretty gradual. Even around here in Nashville, it's pretty gradual. But here they take off at a little bit higher steep and pitch, and you take off like this. Now I need you to get how this is going. We're flying on this flight, and what we have is I'm seated on the aisle. I'm the aisle seat right now. This is me. Right next to me is my lovely wife, Jenny, who I've had the privilege to be married to for 42 years. She's seated right next to me. Thank you for those three applause. Uh, that's what 42 years of marriage gets you. Th three people applauding. That's all right. No mercy applause. Problem was that three people, two of them missed uh, when they were doing it. I watched them as an uncoordinated group. But here we are. I'm seated in the aisle seat. Right next to me is Jenny. Right behind Jenny, cat corner to me, is Cody, my son. Right behind me is unknown lady. She just happens to have the seat. So I want you to get it. Me, Jenny, Cody, unknown lady. Now, for those of you that are Pentecostal, that's as close to me dancing in the spirit as you will ever see. Me, Jenny, Cody, unknown lady. That's it. Now, now here's the deal. Uh, we take off. We're at a higher pitch, and then we hear the first little uh, bell go off. That means you've reached 10,000 feet. New set of rules begin to come in for the pilot. You reach 10,000 feet, but when we reach 10,000 feet, here's what happens. The plane goes clank. Now, you don't want a plane to ever go clank. If you don't fly a whole lot, non-clanking planes are the best news. <laughs> So the plane goes clank and it leans this way, but then it levels. And then it goes clank again and it leans this way, but then it levels, but it doesn't hold level. It goes like this. So here's Mother Earth. Here's our plane flying. Here's how you want your plane to fly. Here's how you don't want your plane to fly. This is good. This is bad. Good plane, bad plane, right there. So we're now flying like this. So Cody, who's over here, if he wanted to look out and see the ground, here's what he'd typically do. He'd go like this and he'd look down. He doesn't have to go like that now. He just go like this and he's staring right at the ground. It's just going, and he's going like this. Now you gotta understand my son. My son is not loud, he's not over the top, but you gotta understand something. I come from a Pentecostal faith. We believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit and we believe in speaking in other tongues. And so what happened was when the plane went clank, clank, everything's fine, but when it went clank, 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 Cody went Pentecostal. And so, when it goes like this, Cody goes, and, and he's just breaking loose. I'm sitting here and I'm going, that's my son. He's full of the Holy Ghost. That's the Holy Ghost right there. He goes, there's none of this. My faith's between me and Jesus. His faith was for everyone on that plane right now. There's none of this private plane because when your plane's flying like this, there's not private faith. You can have private faith like this. You don't have it when you're flying. So you're going, Shandala Kahandala, Batara And I'm sitting there, I'm hearing this, I'm going, Cody, go. Go there. I thought I was going to have to ask for the mic to interpret. Just to be scriptural, you go, Shandala Kahandala. But now this lady that we don't know, she starts, when he goes, Shandala, she goes, blankety blank, in the name of blank, holy blank, God blank blank. He's going, Shandala Kahandala. Blankety blank, shotakaha, blankety blank. I'm hearing this. And I'm just loving it because shandalaka, blankety blank. Now, some of you, you're not filled with the spirit and don't speak with tongues. You don't know what shandalaka dala means, but you know what blank blank means because that is the language you speak. Uh, I apologize. Too much church just happened for some of you. And so we're sitting there, and, and we're going, 
Shandaka, blankety blank. And I'm listening to this and I'm just enjoying it because I'm thinking when we land, I got a sermon illustration. And if you're a pastor, you'll do anything. You'll fly like this to get a sermon illustration. <laughs> Because if you can do it, they, you just use those things all the time. So this thing's going on like that and everything. And then my little old wife that's been married to me for 42 years, she puts her little arm. She puts her little arm between the, the, the little rest between, you know, and she starts patting him on the knee. Okay, Cody, it's going to be all right, baby. It's going to be all right. Now the kid's 20-something. It's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. You know, it's going to be all right. Now I'm married to the girl for 42 years. No one's, hey, now you don't have to cheer. No one's patting my knee. I'm not getting any love from mama. I mean, I'm there. I could have been a part of the singles ministry that day. She's patting his knee. I'm just sitting there. The lady's blanking. He's sitting there going in the Holy Spirit. Mama's loving. I'm here all by myself. <laughs> they ended up leveling the plane. One of our engines had blown out. That's why you always fly on a plane with two. <laughs> they only need one. One of them had blown out. You always count when you get on two. <laughs> and so we ended up coming back. I love the pilot. He must have gone to the same ministerial school that your pastor. If you notice your pastor gets up, he's just so sweet. Oh, let me just tell you, God wants to encourage you. God just wants to bless you. Truly, truly. <laughs> it's just so good. Can I tell you how good your pastor is? They brought out the mini me pulpit tonight. If they'd have brought out his, I'd be looking like this, saying, hey. But they brought out the mini-me one. But the pilot had gone to the same school wherever you went. Uh, we need to check that diploma. But they had gone to that same school because he said, now when we land, we're coming back. You're going to see a lot of fire engines and ambulances, but they're just there to welcome us home. Don't you just think that's a good way to put it? It's none of those get in a crash position. We all land, people are clapping, and they're just all happy, and they're just thrilled. And so we get off the plane and everything. They said, we're going to bring in a new plane. Everyone was happy with that. We weren't real ha happy with the old plane. <laughs> we get back on the plane. Again, it's me, it's Jenny, it's Cody, it's unknown lady full of blank. And so... <laughs> So we're just sitting there, and, and we're gone. We get past 10,000 feet. We get up to cruising altitude. Pilot comes on. He says, guys, he said, I know that last plane ride was a little troublesome, so I've told the flight attendants, it's open bar. Drinks are on us. <laughs> I'm a pastor. I don't drink, so it just meant unlimited peanuts. But the lady full of blank, she drank. <laughs> and she drank. And she drank, and she drank. And when we landed in Dallas, she was still flying. I mean, that girl, she's up in the air. She just, I mean, people have, we landed now, sweetheart. Can you just get off the plane and everything? No, nah, she just wanting more. <laughs> but here's the deal. There are two and a half inches of armrest. And with two and a half inches, we found out what was in two people's hearts. See, storms tell us what's in you. Is God in you? Or is it the world in you? Two and a half inches, that's all. Between being full of God and being full of nothing. The saddest thing to me was this. All that lady had going in her was what she would drink next. But I'm sitting there watching. And what I can tell you is, the Bible doesn't say you won't have storms. But what the Bible does say is you can have God. And if God's a part of your life, then you're in a position where no matter what the storm is, you'll be able to manage it. 
I talked to my wife after I said, sweetheart, Cody's getting all the love in there. 42 years, we're going to make it 43. I mean, you know, he said, she looked at me and she said, Gerald, the whole time it was going on, it didn't look like it even bothered you. She said, that's why I didn't do anything. You didn't seem bothered. And I thought to myself, I wasn't bothered. There wasn't any fear. There wasn't any question in my mind. There was nothing about it. And people ask, well, how do you get there? Is that just that you're old and you're dumb? Or what is it that you're rolling with up there? And literally what happened was I watched the flight attendants, and they were two more mature, like me, individuals. And they were sitting up there, and the whole time that the plane went like this, 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 they never stopped their conversation. They had started talking about a recipe. They never changed. And I was sitting there, and I was watching and thinking, these people are used to being there, and if they're not upset, why should I? And can I teach you something about storms? The reason some of you struggle in storms is you hang around with people who've never made it through one <laughs> instead of people who have. So what happens is people with bad marriages, they go find other people with bad marriages and hang out with them. Here's the deal. You need to hang out with people who have made it through storms and have made it to the other side. So rule number one, just because you're in a storm, it doesn't mean that you did anything wrong. Rule number two, you may not be given any warning, but new, rule number three, we're going to find out what's in you when a storm hits. Rule number four, Jesus specializes in bad weather days. In Mark chapter four and verse 37, I got to up my game, you know, he's quoting Hebrew up here. And so now I got to quote the Greek. In Mark chapter four, verse 37, Jesus has ministered all day. And as he's ministered all day, he looks at his disciples. He says, guys, you've got to uh, get in the boat. We got to go to the other side. Jesus reacts because he's got a, a humanity just like everybody else at that point, a physical body. He's tired and he goes and he does what every pastor on Sunday afternoon does. And he takes a nap. And so he goes to the boat and he takes the nap. And then it says, and a storm came. And it says that when the storm came, now you got to remember, three of the 12 were professional fishermen. They're used to being on the lake. They know what to do. But the storm gets so bad that they can't handle it. And then it says in Mark chapter 4 and verse 37, it says, and the boat is now full of water. The boat is now full of water. Let me ask you a question. When a boat's now full of water, what happens to it? If it's full of water, it's going under. It says the boat's now full of water. Look it up in the Greek. You know what it says? And the boat's now full of water. In fact, translators struggle with it because they don't get it in their head. They're thinking the boat can't be full of water. But in the Greek, it says the boat's now full of water. You look it up in any version, the boat is now full of water. It's now full of water, but it's not sinking. Why is that? Because when Jesus is on your boat, it doesn't matter how bad the storm, you don't go under. See, for some of you, your biggest takeaway from this message has been this. If I ever see that guy get on a plane, I'm not getting on with him. <laughs> that has been your biggest emotional takeaway. He gets on a plane, I'm not. And you missed the whole part. If you want to get on any plane, you get on mine. Because when I get on the plane, Jesus is getting on. It doesn't matter if we get hit by lightning. It doesn't matter if we lose an engine. It doesn't matter if we have extreme turbulence. We're getting where we're going because Jesus is on the plane with us. Now look at me. When it comes to your life, you have a question. Is Jesus on your boat? Well, I'm in church. This is his boat, not yours. A lot of people will take a weekend trip around the lake. That's his boat. But when you go to work tomorrow, is Jesus on your boat? It doesn't matter that he's on mama's boat. Is he on yours? Four things about a storm. You're not wrong just because you're in a storm. You're not always get warned. 
Sometimes storms are going to tell us what's inside, but Jesus specializes in bad weather days. And if Jesus is on your boat, it doesn't matter how much water gets in, you're not going under. You're getting to the other side. (laughs) Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray right now that you would do what I can't do. See, I can deliver an outline. I can communicate a lesson. But only you can minister. You're the only one that can take information and turn it into revelation. You're the only one that can take us a step further and minister to the hearts because you're the only one that knows the heart condition of everyone in this room. So, Lord, right now I pray that you would minister. That somehow you would take the lessons of a storm and you would speak to the hearts, to people who've lost hope. They can't tell whether it's day or night anymore. I thank you, Father, that you are the God of all hope. To people who are going through tribulation and tough times, I thank you that you're the God who's overcome the world. For people who are dealing with the unexpected, unexpected things happen naturally, but you never change supernaturally. And Lord, for people who've never had the x-ray of the soul, let it be clear to them what's really inside them. I pray today, Lord, that people would take a journey with you and know you. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I'm going to ask three questions. The first question is this. Is Jesus on your boat? Do you have a relationship with him? Have you ever opened your heart to him? Have you ever made a decision that you want him to be a part of your life? Now, when I say that, let me talk about what I'm not saying. I'm not asking if you're a member of my church or this church. I'm not asking if you've gone through confirmation. I'm not asking if you've gone through dedication. I'm not asking if you've gone through water baptism. I'm saying that if you were on whatever road is in front of this church, you didn't see a car, it ran into you, you were injured and you took your last breath, do you know that when you take your last breath that you're right with God and you go to heaven? Do you know that when you close your eyes here that you open your eyes there? Do you know it? If you don't know that, I want to pray with you. Second question. Maybe you're here today and you would say, hey, I know I'm a Christian. I have faith in God. But are you close to Him? See, Jesus doesn't come into your life to be a part of your life. Jesus comes into your life to be the center. And if he's not the center of it, today's the day. Because he's not peripheral in your life. He is what everything centers around in your life. So if you can't say that you're close to him, today's the day. Third question, if you can say that you're a person of faith and you're close to him, then thirdly, have you ever been filled with the spirit like it talks about Acts chapter 2 and verse 4? And that when you're filled with the spirit... You've received that heavenly prayer language so that you can pray the perfect prayer when the engine goes out on your plane. If you have it, you need everything that God has for you. So while heads are bowed and eyes are closed, in any one of those three areas you know that I'm talking to you, I'd like to pray with you. If you'd like to be a part of that prayer, I need you to raise your hand right now. Any one of those three areas, I see that hand, 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 that hand. There's too many hands. If you raise your hand, I'm going to ask you to do me a favor because I want to know who I'm praying with. I just need you to stand up where you're at. If you raise your hand, we're not talking about mama now. We're talking about you. Would you raise your hand? If you raise it, you stand up. Now, I'm just talking to you right now. We're about to pray a prayer, and this is what's going to happen. That prayer is going to do one of three things. When we pray that prayer, if you don't know Christ, it's going to lead you, if that's what you raised your hand. If you do know Christ and you're not close to him, you're going to refocus your attention, and you will be close. If you want to be filled with the Spirit, because that's what it's going to position you to be filled with the Spirit. So at the end of this service, when hands are laid on you, you will receive your heavenly prayer language. But here's the thing about church. 
Nobody buys season tickets to church. There are no spectators. You're either helping people receive or you're receiving. So everyone's going to pray this prayer because we're going to help everyone who's standing. If everyone will repeat after me. Heavenly Father, you said in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, that if I believe with my heart and confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, that I would be saved. Today I'm doing that. I believe with all my heart that Jesus is Lord. Therefore, I thank you for saving me and changing my life forever in Jesus' name. And I believe that right now I'm asking you to fill me with the Holy Spirit. And I believe that when hands are laid on me, I will instantly receive my heavenly prayer language. I believe that when hands are laid on me, I will instantly receive my heavenly prayer language in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I want you to look at me right now. If you raised your hand, to accept Jesus. That's the greatest of all miracles that ever happens. That's the greatest. The second thing. If you weren't close to him, you didn't get saved again. You just redirected your faith. But in the third area, the end of this service, I have a group of talented people that I brought with me. They're pastors from all over the world that will be up here. They'll be lined up here and they're going to lay hands on you. And when they lay hands on you, you will receive your heavenly prayer language because that's what we believe. And so I'm going to need you because we're not going to keep people here long. But if you want to receive so that you're ready, all of these guys will be up here. They'll lay hands on you and you will receive in the name of Jesus because you've already believed it. I want to say thank you, Mike. You're a rock star. Not because we use that term lightly, but because you've loved Jesus passionately. Steph, I'm a fan. Thank you for your faithfulness. I'm going to let the pastor close the service. If you came to get filled with the Spirit, as soon as it's finished, you come up here. You'll have hands laid on you. So I asked, I told Pastor Gerald, I said, man, just preach like you're at home. Because anybody that we invite to preach here, we've given, <clears throat> we've given consideration and trust and confidence for them. And I've told y'all for years, uh, this is the way, this is what we believe for you. And I know that this is new to some of y'all, but I just want you to trust God. And you've asked for it, now receive it and let the Lord have his way. Uh, <clears throat> so would everybody stand with me together? And those of you that need prayer, uh, you just make your way through the crowd. If you don't want to stick around for that, you're welcome to go out, grab a coffee on your way out, and have a wonderful night, and I'll see you here on Sunday. And uh, if you have questions, you can email them to randy at lifepointchurch.tv. Hey, God's doing a great thing. God's doing a great thing. Just so you know, I pray in tongues every day, and I pray for you that way. I pray in tongues every time I'm down here in the front, and uh, I believe it's a, it's a blessing from the Lord. And I want everything God has for us. And I told you tonight, we want to come to the Lord. We want to hear from God. And we want to move accordingly. So if you need to take that step, come on. Um, I'm going to ask these pastors, if you would, please. Just, and our staff, <clears throat> if you'd just be available in the front. Pastor Marie, if you guys would help me out. And Lord, we love you. Come on, everybody, lift your hands to the Lord. God, we honor you. We worship you. And we thank you for what you're doing in us. And we receive all that you have for us. God, and we thank you in the name of Jesus for the goodness of God is here tonight. We've heard from heaven. Lord, we've heard the word and we want to walk with Jesus. Trust that you're in every storm with us. And we thank you, Lord, that we can live this life full of the spirit of the living God in Jesus name.